and I'll be discussing today on the topic of how obstacles on the path of a determined devotee become opportunities and we'll talk this based on the Ramayana and the story of Hanuman in Lanka. So first let's look at certain principles that we can understand then we'll see how those principles are demonstrated in the Ramayana and then we'll come back to some conclusion. All of us, we are at some level or the other looking for happiness in life. At the same time, if we look at what really satisfies us, even if we look at our own lives backwards, we will find that it is not just a life of passivity and lethargy. If somebody told you, okay, for the rest of your life, you just don't do anything. You sit at your home, watch comedies, watch movies for the rest of your life. Now, if we have a lot of hard work to do and we want some break, we might think oh, that's nice. But after some time, we'll want a break from that also. We want something. If we look at our lives, broadly speaking, we want something stimulating to do. Now, stimulation can come at one level simply by some passive, like some, an entertainment, what happens? Yes, we are passive recipients of the stimulation. But that is just one kind of stimulation. Another is where we do something challenging. And we like to do something challenging. Say, people, even if when they're sitting and playing some, say, sports are played for enjoyment. But sports is not just played for enjoyment. People exercise, people train, and they try to do some they excel in some way. Even that which we try to do for enjoyment, we want some challenge in that. Mm. Say, if uh, even if somebody is playing a crossword puzzle, or playing some cube, or playing some chess, it's some intellectual challenge. So even for, there is no even pleasure without some sense of challenge. So, of course, there we can say there are different kinds of pleasures. But in general, when we want pleasure, it's usually with some kind of challenge that we like to meet. There are some problems which you just don't like. Say somebody is not good at language and then you tell them to solve a crossword puzzle. Now, it's a it, it, they can't see it as a challenge because they feel it's a burden, they don't like it. But somebody who likes language and then a crossword puzzle, oh, that's nice, I, I have to do it. The point is, we want some challenge in life. Now, if it's, a it's something which we like to do and there's a challenge in that, it becomes enjoyable. Conversely, if we look at problems in our life, see broadly, if you look at our life journey, this is our life journey, two things we meet on. Sometimes we get pleasure and sometimes we get trouble. Sometimes we get problems. Now, if you look at the trouble that we face in our life, Psychologists have found, and this is also time-tested truth, that there are two ways we can face trouble. One is that we can be resentful about it. We can be, why is this happening to me? Why this problem? Why this problem? Why this problem? And resentment just weakens us. Now, being resentful is like driving a car with the brake pressed. All that happens is a lot of noise and a lot of fuel consumption. But the car doesn't move forward. Like that when we are resentful about some situation, some problem we are facing, that resentment simply, simply exhausts us. But it doesn't lead to anything constructive. However, in a difficult situation, if somebody voluntarily, okay, now I've got this problem, they, volu they voluntarily take up, let me see how I can deal with it. Let me see what I can do about it. When we accept that problem, we may not have wanted the problem, but now that it has come, we, okay, put aside the resentment and start working on it. Suppose sometimes we have some, some project deadline or something like that, say at work, or something, some 
सम वर्क इज वी जस्ट कीप पुटिंग ऑफ कीप पुटिंग ऑफ कीप पुटिंग ऑफ एंड देन फाइनली द डेड लाइन इज सो क्लोज दैट यू कॉन्ट पुट इट ऑफ से मे बी मोस्ट ऑफ अर्स डूट दिन वी स्टडिंग फॉर आर एग्जाम्स we put it off put it off and then now it's two three days or one week for the exam now you can't put it off anymore then you sit down and study and then you study for hours and hours and hours and although in a sense it's exhausting it's 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 there's a lot of anxiety in it but then you get things done isn't it now how many of you work on deadlines isn't it most of us in rajoguna If there were no deadlines, what would happen is practically nothing would get done, isn't it? <laughs> Very few things would get done if there were no deadlines. So now, after we start doing something, even if deadline bound, so all along we are dragging our foot along to doing it. I don't want to do this. You know, dragging our feet is a phrase when you want to parents want to take a child somewhere and the child doesn't want to go. So the child doesn't move the feet only, and the parents are dragging, dragging. So it's like that, dragging the feet. Sometimes we drag our feet along in doing something, but eventually when we start doing it, because there's no alternative now. I cannot avoid it, so then we start doing it, and we start doing it. We realize, hey, this is not that bad. I can do it. And then usually toward the end, as we start completing it, we are feeling, if only I had a little more time. If I had started a little bit earlier, I could have done it well also. So once we start doing something, eventually we. often our mind makes the trouble seem to be much bigger than what it is so again with respect to trouble we as i said we can have a resentful attitude or we can have a purposeful attitude okay i have to do this let me take this up and do it so if we have that purposeful attitude we grow by it we learn we grow we improvise but if we have a resentful attitude we just stagnate we stagnate and exhaust ourselves now when people are resentful when they wake up in the morning the only thing they think of is when I, when can i sleep again right <laughs> they have when they are resentful there is practically nothing to look forward to in life oh this is bad this is bad this is bad this is bad so it's a, it's not a very pleasant situation to be in so basically we all if we can take up some challenge in our life then that is a healthy stimulation that enables us to grow now of course when problems come sometimes some problems seem to serve a purpose but why is this problem coming that see, most of we are not actually afraid of pain per se and nobody likes pain but what we really resent is purposeless pain Say if there is some titanic, titanus uh, infection in the atmosphere, and the government or the medical uh, community issues a statement, everybody please take a titanus shot. Now we all go to the hospital and we take a shot. Then. Now it's painful to have a pin prick into our body, but we go there and we pay for it. But we're just walking along a road, and some thorn pricks us. Now we feel annoyed. We feel angry. Why is this thorn here? So in both cases, the sensation is the same. Something pricking our body. But in the one case, we see it as purposeful. In another case, we see it as purposeless. So the point I'm making over here is, if we have a purpose, we don't want even even pleasure which is purposeless. If we have something purposeful in that something challenging, something purpose. Yeah, I want to do this. I want to solve this thing. I want to learn this. I want to do this. Within that, the pleasure we get is deep, and it is fulfilling. And even in trouble, we can face the trouble if there is some purpose that we see. Now, problems are there in the world for everyone. The world is a tough place. I've traveled across the world. Many of you may also have traveled. if you get to talk with people even very successful people if you scrape a little below the surface when everybody is working through their own tragedies somebody has lost a loved one somebody has got some debilitating disease somebody has got serious serious mental health issues everybody is in trouble and that's the world is a place which puts everyone into trouble but we have the 
we can have the strength within us to take that trouble and move forward purposefully. Now what happens is, atheism. Atheism doesn't remove any problems. Whether you are a theist or an atheist, whatever problems are there in the world, they are there for everyone. Atheism doesn't remove the problems. It just removes the hope that the problems have a purpose. Because within the atheistic worldview, there is no purpose for life, ultimately. We are born, we live for a few years, few decades, and then we die. And that's the end. It's like our existence is just like a tiny flash in which there is some bag of protoplasm that is just flapping around. And afterwards, there's a between two infinities of nothingness, we exist for a short while. What is the point of that? But on the other hand, if we have a theistic worldview, a devotional worldview, then we understand that actually there is a purpose to life. The purpose is that we are all on a journey of spiritual evolution. Our consciousness is meant to evolve towards the infinite, towards Krishna. Expand our capacity for wisdom, expand our capacity for love, and ultimately attain Krishna. So whatever problems we face in our lives, they all have a purpose. That does not mean every problem is good. Problems can sometimes be bad and bad things happen in life. But there is good that can emerge from it. And there are broadly, when we talk about problems, it's a, there, there is something called as moral evil and there is natural evil. Natural evil means say suddenly a storm comes up, earthquake comes up. We don't, with our vision, we don't see a personal agent behind it. But moral evil is where some person is, is bent on destroying us. Somebody acts like our enemy, like our rival, either they're backbiting against us, they're spreading malicious rumors, or sometimes some people, they're out to physically attack and kill someone. Sometimes people have irrational hatred towards a particular individual or even a particular community. So basically, when somebody is out to get us, at that time, to maintain this point that even this has a purpose. Why is this person against me like this? Why is this person out to destroy me? And what can I do? But even through that, we there is a they, they may create problems for us, but even through that, we can grow. And so if we see, if we ourselves have a purpose, then even if others create problems in our way, the problems will obstruct us, they will trouble us, but we will move onward. It's like say, if you are moving on a small cycle and then a big tree falls on the way, what will happen? You will just be stopped. But if you are driving a big truck and you are going fast and you are going uh, towards something very important and the, truck has fallen, and the tree has fallen on the way, you could just barrel on and the tree will be knocked out of the path and you will keep moving on. So if we have a strong sense of purpose, that gives us momentum. And by that momentum, we can barrel through obstacles. We can keep moving ahead through obstacles. So we will see how Hanuman, he went through various obstacles without becoming disheartened. Although, you know, he was in enemy territory with someone out to get him. And in this case, the theme which I was going to focus on is that, like I talked about both pleasure and trouble. Actually, the pleasure, if it involves some challenge, it helps us grow. The trouble, if we see it as purposeful, that also helps us to grow. So, so sometimes malevolent people, people who are out to get us, the very problems with which they try to hurt those who are devoted, those problems actually empower the devoted and they backfire against them. That's the principle we see through this story. We'll try to see through this story. So now Hanuman's appearance in the Ramayana is probably among the most dramatic appearances. Of course, every character in the Ramayana is dramatic, but Hanuman is, uh, is he appears first in the 
Kishk in the section of the Ramayana and then in the Sundar Kant he takes over and by the time he leaps into Lanka you can see that although it is Ramayana for the large part of the later half of it's it's like Hanumayan it's not Ramayana there's so much about Hanuman in fact in the whole Sundar Kant Ram is only at the beginning and the end it's all about Hanuman's activities so Hanuman single-handedly leaps to Lanka penetrates finds Sita and consoles her and then finally uh, he decides that now I have completed my service now let me do some extra service so sometimes we may desire to do some extra service but we do it after we have completed our service not before somebody tells us can you cook rice for we have a festival can you cook rice says I think okay yeah rice yeah it's just, it's good I want to cook sweet, sweet rice and you start cooking sweet rice and you have sweet rice but there's no rice only sweet rice is nice but first cook rice that is the essential food and sweet rice is also nice but that's a desert so you know we may want to do some extra service but first complete the allotted service then do the extra service so Hanuman does that and he thinks what should I do he thinks that uh, let me warn Ravan let me see if Ravan listens and also let me look at the military formations Hanuman is also a warrior and warriors understand that you have to understand the enemy's strengths, the enemy's weaknesses what kind of soldiers they have, what kind of military formations they have so he wants to observe it all so what he does is he starts disrupting the forest the, the, uh, the, the jungle like the garden like forest where Sita is kept and then Hanuma uh, to stop him Ravan sends one by one first he sends an elite band of soldiers King Karas then he sends one of his foremost generals Jambu Mali and then he sends another set of generals and then he sends his own son Aksha and one by one Hanuman overcomes all of them and finally they, he sends whom? Indraji. And Indrajit is the Brahmastra which captures Hanuman. And when Hanuman is captured by that, now Hanuman has a benediction which no one knows about. That the Brahmastra, it acts on him to bind him but only for finite time. And whenever he wants, after that he can release himself. So he's bound, now as soon as he's bound, the demons they have him as like a captive and they start humiliating him they are dragging him through the streets and they take him to, to Ravan's court and they take him to Ravan's court Hanuman throughout it all his, as he's being dragged along the streets he's observing the whole Lanka's encampment okay how is it so he is observing and learning and then finally he comes into Ravan's court and there and naturally, uh, the Rakshasas think, oh, there is monkey, he has caused so much disruption to us. So he may be scared. He says, uh, we will release you soon, but tell us, who are you? And why have you come here? Why did you cause so much disruption? So he says that uh, Ravan has already concluded that this monkey is very powerful. Because somebody can kill Jambu Mali, somebody can overpower Maksha. They cannot be ordinary. So he says, who are you? So Hanuman says, I am, I, I am the servant of Sugriv and I am the messenger of Ram. And I have now let I'll speak something which will be for the good of all of you. Now initially, when he sees Ravan, he is impressed to see Rav, Ravan's opulence in Lanka. Now there's so much gold all around. And Ravan also looks so powerful. And Hanuman's first thought is: if only this Ravan had been virtuous he could have become a protector of the gods now, even when, a uh, when uh, those are devotees they see somebody even if that person is presently demoniac the devotee always tries to see the spiritual potential in everyone of course we can't only see the spiritual potential we also have to see the present action some people say see everyone equally 
yes equal disposition is equal vision is good but equal action is not good mm -hmm. say somebody might say that okay all living beings are souls all living beings are equal but there's a difference between say a cat and a tiger although you could say they are both in the same species in biology but you know, if a cat is nearby and we clap the cat will go away <laughs> but there is a tiger nearby and we clap we will go away <laughs> hmm? so uh, hanuman he recognizes sees the spiritual potential but he also sees that this person is presently such a acting such a terrible demoniac way and then he gives a stern warning he briefly tells the whole story of ram how he has descended to fulfill the purpose of the devatas and how he has overcome on uh, he has overcome tataka and subahu and then khar and dushan and kabandha and so many other demons and he says that not even a not even a hundred ravanas will be able to fight against ram uh, nobody can stop ram from coming and rescuing sita oh ravan if you know what is good for you heed this advice return sita that is the only way return sita to ram and seek beg his forgiveness that is the only way for your safety now ravan is a king he is sitting on his throne in his kingdom and he is used to giving instructions he is not habituated to being instructed or being advised now actually it is a very uh, it is a very unsafe position to be in if we are in a position only to give instruction and not take instruction from anyone what happens that then that case is that that some people just become so self centered like some people are very short tempered they get angry very quickly and then then they are counsel you know you may have to take some anger management lessons or anger management courses now they are so self righteous they say i don't need any anger management course you just need to learn to stop making me angry <laughs> <laughs> so they outsource the responsibility for their anger <laughs> so now yes we all will face provocative situations but there are limits no normally different people respond to anger in different ways or when they when they are provoked some people they just give silent treatment they don't talk with anyone only they just stay silent or some people just answer in grunts no or in the, they just are very uncommunicative some people when they get angry they start banging things they bang, whatever they they take a plate and keep it banging it down they do a lot of noise which conveys their anger hmm? some people what happens their tongue loses its break when they get angry <laughs> and they just attack and you speak such things hey what are you speaking so some people it's not just physical not just verbal they might even become physically aggressive start throwing things at each other or throwing some other things now of course nowadays you know some people have guns and then some road race some people might take a gun and shoot so now all this is anger but what happens all of us have certain based on our culture our consciousness our circumstances we have a certain limit to how we express our anger hmm? and if somebody says i was i did a, a seven a, a retreat in brisbane on burn ang, uh, anger before anger burns you so there's how many of you feel that you can't control your anger so okay any of you i would put myself i said yeah I, there are times but if somebody says i can't control my anger but is that really true said so suppose you are working in your office and your boss suddenly gives you a lot of work now what will, what will happen you feel angry but will you control your anger <laughs> yes is <isn't> it <laughs> so who is going to yell at their boss we feel angry and we may yell after the boss has gone away 
But we all have the capacity to control our anger. Nobody can say I can't control my anger. It is just that do we have enough impetus to control? But when the anger when the anger comes out, based on our culture, our upbringing, we have certain limits. You know, no matter what happens, however angry I get, this is what I will never do. Hmm? So those who are demoniac, so the divine and the demoniac, everybody has anger within them. But just the limits of how the anger is expressed, that varies. The divine might just, uh, might just not talk or might just walk away or might, uh, those who are, they also get angry. But those who are demoniac, they might become verbally abusive, physically abusive. Use, uh, so they have, the limits for them are very, very less. They may have no limits. So basically, we are, very few people will be free from, entirely free from lust or anger or greed or these things. But we are defined by what are our limits. Even when this gets provoked, how far do I go? And in the case of Ravan, he was at a position of power where he felt that nobody had any authority to challenge him. How dare anyone challenge him? How dare anyone instruct him? So just hearing those words of instruction, what happened is that made Ravan angry. Who are you to instruct me? Upadesho hi murkhana prakopaya nashantaye. It is said those who are foolish, when you give them instruction, what happens? They get angry. They get angry. How are you to instruct me? And he said, this arrogant monkey, kill it. Now, initially, when he had brought, he had been brought in, Ravan's first impulse was kill him. He has disrupted my gardens, and he has killed so many of our soldiers. But his general professor said, "Wait, wait. Okay, let's find out who he is. Why did he come here? Let's get that information." I said, "Okay." Ravan once, Ravan said, "Yeah, makes sense." But then when he again gave the order, kill him. So then. Vibhishan intervened and Vibhishan said that if he has come as a messenger of Ram, you can, the codes forbid us from killing any messenger. So, I know, Ravan is still so angry, he says, but he didn't act like a messenger. He said, he has destroyed our garden, he has killed so many of our soldiers. So now Hanuman, he decides to play along and he says actually you know, after I flew I leapt across the ocean and came all the way I was so tired and so hungry <laughs> so I was just looking for some fruits and in my eagerness to look for some fruits I jumped from one tree to another and the trees fell down <laughs> and now when the trees fell down the soldiers, instead of asking me what I wanted, they came and started attacking me. <laughs> and I had to defend myself. So he says, whoever I killed, it was, only, it was only because they were trying to kill me. So I acted only for self-defense and survival. Now, Ravan did not like this turn of events. And he thought, he still wanted to punish Anumas. He said, okay. He knew Vibhishan still was right. So, he said, okay. He needs to be punished. Let's punish him by burning his tail. He says, monkeys are very attached to their tails. They're proud of their tails. So, let's burn it. Now, this burning, he had multiple purposes for that. First is that, just it was like, it was very painful to have a part of your body burnt it's in see it's if there is fire nearby and if at that time it's, we, we want to keep a safe distance from the fire but if somebody takes our hand and tries to push it in the fire we'll try to fight back against it but if somebody tries to consciously burn a part of our body it can be horrifyingly painful okay. so uh, First of all, just the burning would be painful. Secondly, his plan was that after that, he 
would be permanently mutilated and especially for somebody who is a warrior who is heroic now to have that kind of mutilation would be humiliating and uh, to increase that humiliation with his tail burnt uh, ravan's plan was let him be paraded in all of lanka so that everybody learns what is the fate of anyone who dares to cross the king of lanka so it was a diabolically cold blooded plan to cause a lot of pain and then they uh, they executed their plan and then they got they got cloth they they got cotton they got fuel oil and then they slit the tail now hanuman was ready to bear that pain he knew the tail would burn it would be painful now his plan was he had already come in and he his plan was now although everybody thought that he was still bound he was no longer bound the brahmastra was not acting on him he had already sensed that his plan was as soon as they set the tail on fire he will immediately break free escape and go away and during that time while his tail would be set on fire he was ready to tolerate it now whatever was happening in the court of lanka that is the mm, that was the like the happening place so everything that is happening there was breaking news going everywhere <laughs> so when this decision was made from the court there was like a network of messengers who, who told in the ashokwatika and in the ashokwatika sita came to know about it that hanuman has been captured and hanuman's tail is going to be burnt so at that time sita prayed o oh, agni dev please don't let the fire burn scald or burn hanuman steel whatever punya i have please let that act to protect his steel from being burnt so hanuman on his side was ready to tolerate the pain and when the fire was set he could feel the heat and he was ready and as he was waiting suddenly it is burning burning sensation the heat was there and suddenly he felt there's no pain there's fire all around him he could feel the heat of the fire but he could not feel any burn by the fire he looked around what happened he saw that actually the tail is on fire the tail was burning in the sense that there was fire around the tail but he felt no pain he thought about it he was also intelligent so okay. this must be who now he had his mystic powers but he was not Uh, he had not tried to do anything at that point his plan was just to escape but when he realized this must be sita must be praying for me because of that this has happened right because of sita's prayer although this tail is burning it is not burning so it's like normally if a candle burns the candle burns and the candle gets exhausted but here his tail was burning it was neither hurting nor was it getting reduced to ashes it was just burning and what happened was that he had a long tail and all that tail had been tied with cloth and with cotton so that it could catch fire so the flames spread all around his tail and now hanuman saw an opportunity this fire will now backfire <laughs> <laughs> that fire it is not burning him now so now he can use it to now, to cause damage to lanka and he just as he was being tied and the monkeys were planning to drag the the one the rakshas were dragging him out of the forest and they see you know, why is this monkey monkey is not feeling any pain at all what is going on the tail is burning so then suddenly as soon as he had got into got out of the palace out of the court into the middle of the central building of you know that the cbd of lanka <laughs> so central business district of lanka which was there 
he came there and there he just leapt off and he leapt up he just all those who were around him guarding him tying him holding him they all just flew off such was his force of his jump and he went right near the building and he went on top of the building and his tail he started moving now much of lanka was golden now gold does not burn very easily hmm. in fact one of the ways of testing gold is that if you heat the gold and all the alloys that are there in it they melt away gold has a very high melting point so it does not catch fire very easily and much of lanka it was not even some of it was golden ravana's palace was golden some of it was gold plated but whatever it was hanuman just kept moving his tail and soon the whole building caught fire and as soon as the building caught fire and one look around now it is immediately jumped to the next building and the demons were so shocked initially how does monkey escape and they tried to charge near him but the fire was burning so fiercely they couldn't get to him and by the time they got near him he had jumped to the next building and then the next building and the next building and not only had hanuman broken free but now he is causing havoc among the rakshasa forces when ravan heard it he just came out of his palace he went to his terrace of his palace uh, from his court and he looked around he saw all around him there are buildings which are burning so Ra- ravan was in fury and what is this he said catch that monkey and before anyone could reach him to catch him he would just jump and go to another building and he was so fast and he was so fiery that no body could come near him at all no matter what they tried and one by one by one by one hanuman started setting all the nearby buildings of lanka on fire so as is setting this on fire the and everything started burning i started burning it was like a whole conflagration and hanuman was aided by agni and by vayu what did vayu do vayu is the wind god and wind god is the father of hanuman so what happened was when when a forest fire comes the wind is can be a terrible thing now if the fire is small then the wind can extinguish the fire but if the fire is big then the wind spreads the fire in fact that is how the principle is even for this is example also given for law and separation Now it is said that separation makes the heart grow fonder, and that is the principle of Gaudiya Vaishnavism also. Sometimes when you are separated from Krishna, our bhakti increases. So separation is like wind, and love is like fire. So when we are separated from the Lord, when the gopis were separated from Krishna, their love for Krishna increased because separation was like the wind, and the fire of their love grew stronger and stronger and stronger. But that is not always the case. what happens otherwise if our love is small you know if our bhakti is tender and we say okay i go away from the association of devotees then that separation will not make our devotion stronger <laughs> what will happen it will extinguished if the fire is small it will get extinguished they say so separation makes the heart go fonder for someone else <laughs> 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 if there is too much separation for too long then it doesn't mean necessarily make the heart grow fonder so so here as the wind started blowing everything one by one by one everything started burning and as hanuman was burning lanka or ravan was infuriated and he just couldn't do anything was hanuman was so fiery and so fast that whatever anybody tried to do nobody could reach and eventually the demons became so fearful who is this being they had already thought that this is not any ordinary being how could an ordinary being be so powerful 
but now they thought is this rudra who is come to do the destruction is this yamraj who has come to punish ravana is this indra who has come to take revenge because ravana had offended all the gods at different times so who is this being just couldn't digest it and then finally as ravana started burning all of anuma uh, started burning all of lanka then hanuman came to the edge there was a border wall of lanka he stood on the border and he started surveying much of lanka was on fire and the demons were running here and there now what was hanuman trying to do hanuman his purpose was not simply to destroy so it is said that war can often be avoided not just by peace but also by deterrence deterrence means that you know if a person understand that this person is also strong this person can also hit back then the other person gets subdued now if one part if they say that two countries are hostile and one country keeps continuously doing kind one atrocious activity one terrorist activity one incursion one aggression there is that there is that violence then and the other country just keeps okay let go let go let go let go then what happens that country keeps doing again and again and again and again so you know deterrence is what you know, if you hit me i will hit you back and i can hit you back harder than what you can hit me now sometimes this can just lead to an endless conflict now you hit me back i hit you back and it just can go on and on and on and on but if it is understood in general that you if you hit me i will hit you back and the other person will hesitate to hit back mm-hmm. so deterrence is required deterrence is so of for see for most people it is not a, it is not we may not do wrong if we are evolved because we know that the wrong thing is bad to do i should not do this but most people are not at that level most people will not do wrong because they they don't fear the wrong so much as they fear the consequences of the wrong so if there are no consequences of the wrong then they will keep doing the wrong again and again so therefore now deterrence means that if you do this you will get this as a result so if somebody doesn't have that that power in their lives that if you mess with me there will be consequences it's not that i want to i, I don't want to make getting back at you as my as as the mission of my life but if you mess with me there will be consequences then what happens if it, the world is a place of exploitation and I'm, we don't want to be aggressive but we want need to be assertive to be aggressive means you did this to me i do this to you and you do this to me and i do this to you and it just becomes goes on and on and on and people just get completely consumed so that is in rajaguna see there are three things there is being passive being aggressive and being assertive being passive is in tamaguna whatever you want you do and i just accept it and people start treating us like um, uh, they walk over us they exploit us they take us for a they just take us for completely for granted and abuse us but if you become aggressive then what happens just small things can become very big you did this to me and i do this to you and you do this to me and i do this to you and then eventually a small conflict can become catastrophic so we can't be aggressive but we can't be passive either there is assertive assertive means this is important for me and don't mess with this everybody has their conditionings and everybody will make some mistakes so yes we can't get back at people for everything that they do and that's not worth it but there are certain things that are important for us if we have a particular purpose in our life then we need to focus on that purpose and somebody is coming in the way of our purpose we have to create boundaries 
So being assertive is important. So Hanuman was not just being mindlessly violent. His point was to create, to provide deterrence. Now, if you mess with Ram, this is what you are going to get. This is a sample of what you are going to get. So sometimes, small act of aggression can uh, stop a bigger aggression. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can hit me back like this? No, then let's not, let's not mess with you. Now, of course, this is not a universal formula. Yeah, with respect to, uh, it's not that, uh, now, when we, somebody is being assertive and somebody is being aggressive, that is something just to be very carefully decided. But the point is that his violence was not mindless. And he, in that setting fire everywhere, he sudden, as he was sitting and observing the havoc that he had caused on all of Lanka, at one level he felt, yes, mission successful. But then suddenly, he got a thought. If this fire had spread to Ashokwatika, what if Sita is burned in this fire? What a fool I am! What did I do? How could I have been so careless? And as he was berating himself like that, horrified thought that some harm might have befallen Sita, suddenly a celestial voice came Sita is safe, not fear. And Hanuman felt relieved. So although Hanuman used, used the strategy of setting Lanka on fire and this is like often given as an example of the anger being used constructively. Hanuman is the example of using anger for doing service. But there is always the possibility that we may overstep. And that's why Hanuman, as soon as he comes to his sense, hey, have I overstepped? Let me be careful, let me be careful. But because he was had that virtuous intention, so Sita was, Sita was not harmed and then he decided that let me give one last demonstration and he expanded his form and his tail was blazing above him standing like a flag behind him a burning flag and then he roared O oh, Rakshasas I am the least of the servants of Ram if Ravan doesn't return Sita. Thousands and thousands of monkeys like me will soon march into Lanka and destroy it completely. Return Sita or this fire will come again and destroy all of Lanka. And saying this, he just pressed down on the bottom of the wall where he had been standing. And that, as he leapt up, by first pressing down, sprang up, the whole wall collapsed. And Hanuman flew into the sky. From there he flew into the sky, went down into the river, extinguished into the ocean. The sea extinguished the tail and then he flew. He leapt back and all the way back to Lanka. So Hanuman, what did he do over here? He went into Lanka without a single weapon. No, he had to leap across and you know, he travelled light. He travelled light, no, no impediments, no weights. But he went in Lanka without anything. And what did he do? It's one thing to fight against an enemy. And you, the enemy have weapons, you have weapons. And then use your weapons to uh, overpower the enemy. It's quite another. Say the enemy has weapons and you turn their own weapons against them. And shoot them with that. That requires far more expertise. So Hanuman used all the resources of Lanka itself. He went in with nothing, he came out with nothing. It was only his determination. And what he used, the cloth of Lanka, the fuel of Lanka, the buildings of Lanka, the fire said by said, yes, the fire lit by the cities, by the soldiers of Lanka. And then he burnt Lanka. So he, it was a complete disaster for Ravan. In sports like hockey or uh, football, there is something called a self goal. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, the goalkeeper is or the fielders are meant to protect the opponent from hitting a goal. 
but if that player himself the defending player himself hits a goal that's utterly stupid so ravan when he tried to set Ra- hanuman's tail on fire he like he hit a self goal <laughs> but then what hanuman did was he took that opportunity and so one he hit a 100 goals over there tak 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 it was like devastation so for one person to so for ravan initially his pride was so great that nobody can penetrate into lanka but the fact that somebody has penetrated into lanka that was itself a source of anger for him but only did this one person penetrated into lanka he destroyed my gardens he destroyed so many of my soldiers he came and chastised me in my court and then he broke free from the bonds that i had tied to him and then he used the fire that i had lit to hurt him to hurt me so it is one after another after another it is like a series of slaps on the face of ravan ravan was totally more humiliated by that and the purpose was not to humiliate him the purpose was to caution him so although hanuman he had no he had no idea this is how things would turn out now for him he had gone simply to serve ram and after completing the service to ram of giving the message of sita message to sita and taking a message from sita, he could just have left he had a desire to do a greater service more service and that more service got him into big trouble he was captured and he was bound his tail was set on fire but because he remained determined to serve he was determined he was resourceful how can i serve in this situation? how can i serve in this situation how can i serve in this situation and an opportunity came up and through that opportunity dramatic things happened so that which is an obstacle that which was meant to destroy him he turned around and he destroyed his opponents by that very thing and this principle applies in our lives also whenever difficulties come in our lives now if we see those difficulties uh, we don't let those difficulties dishearten us but if you keep persevering keep persevering then the lord will transform those difficulties into opportunities for our growth those were difficulties will themselves become strengths for us when shri prabhupad came to america at that time uh, america was going through what is called as the counter culture the counter culture was a period where the after the second world war america suffered the least damage because no war happened directly in america and america uh, supplied weapons to all the allied countries so they got a lot of money so the Amer- america became very prosperous after the second world war and those youth youth who were born those children who were born at that time they came to their uh, teenage and youth by the 1960s this first world war was from 1941 to 45 roughly uh, then so by the 1960s they were in 15 20 and they are born in prosperity and they felt there's something more we need what is just now just okay earn money have a house have a family have a career so if we want something more in our lives what more is there and they started exploring and somehow through that they got into drugs and many of them became unfortunately very degraded by that and prabhupad came to america he had you could say the toughest audience these were not pious people interested in knowing reverentially knowing about god you know that the only regulative principle of the hippies was to break all regulative principles <laughs> so you know they were see in general from the west from the traditional dharmic perspective the more we move towards the west people are considered degraded mm-hmm. but the hippies were considered degraded even by western standards not indian standards <laughs> so now to speak to them to convince them to persuade them uh, there was an article in the early days in 1966 which came out to prabhupad that he said that swami ji is talking about god to the world's toughest audience 
these people are completely rejected everything they rejected all kinds of authority prabhupada says in lecture that the hippies had already done sarva dharma an paritech <laughs> they had given up their duty to their family to their own careers <laughs> even to their personal hygiene <laughs> but he said i came and taught them how to do maam ekam sharanam <laughs> <laughs> so that which is very difficult what happened that became prabhupad's glory eventually it is very difficult to reach those people very very difficult but when prabhupad reached them and prabhupad transformed them that was a crowning glory for him that that audience was the most difficult when he reached them and transformed them everybody whether it was even the america people were astounded you know, how is swami ji convert transforming these drug addicts and these people who are into drugs he's transforming them and making them into saintly devotees how is this happening so by krishna's arrangement prabhupad faced an extremely difficult situation when he came but because he persevered in that difficult situation that difficulty eventually transformed into his glory so similarly for us if we just purposefully persevere yes we all face difficulties in life there is no uh, no one who doesn't have any difficulties but if we see whatever difficulties are there in my life even if they are coming by just nature's arrangement or they are coming because of some person doing something to me but if we just we are just purposeful we keep moving forward i am going to be fixed in my service to the lord how i do not know then we just keep moving one step forward one step forward one step forward if we keep doing the hanuman did not go in with a complete master plan of what is going to go in lanka first he had to find he just took it one step at a time one step at a time so similarly if we just maintain our determination to serve the lord and then take one step one step one step one step sometimes difficulties may come in our lives and the difficulties can seem overwhelming now when those difficulties seem overwhelming is what becoming disheartened we just focus okay what can i do in this situation o oh, krishna how can i serve in this situation okay if we ask this question that question will become like a flashlight for us okay i can do this i can do this i can do this so we can either ask for why is this not happening why is this not happening why is this not happening hanuman had no facilities sometimes we feel that oh if only i had this facility i could do this if only i had this ability i could do this if only i had this resource i could do this so yes facilities are important but more important than facility is spirituality spirituality means essence of spirituality is service attitude do i really want to serve if i have the desire to serve even if there is no facility facility will be created even if there is obstacle the obstacle will turn into an opportunity and we will be able to move forwards so by the lord's grace opportunities will emerge through obstacles obstacles may enable us to discover our own strengths i'll conclude with the last metaphor at half how sometimes obstacles help us to discover our strengths even a baby elephant is tied up no the ropes tie up the baby elephant and the baby elephant can't do anything but as the elephant grows then if the elephant has something very desirable it sees in front of it maybe some delicious food or a mate or whatever the, the elephant pulls against the ropes and when the elephant pulls against the ropes as it pulls and pulls and pulls initially if something is not very attractive or desirable the elephant think oh these ropes are too strong i can't overcome it mm-hmm. but if there's something which the elephant desperately wants or there is fire all around the elephant and the elephant is tied by a rope then it's a matter of life it will pull and the more the elephant pulls there is there is internal realization of its own strength and there is also external expression of its strength if it's tied to like a big pole or a big tree the elephant may think this this i can't pull this down but if we try if we try determinedly the elephant tries and it can bring down that tree and it can move out so that elephant is also surprised oh i have so much strength and people around us are oh i have so much strength so by krishna's grace 
we can be tougher than what we think we are. By Krishna's grace, when Krishna is with us, we can realize that we have the strength that we didn't know we had. So both, so the, it is only when the obstacles come that we discover our strengths. It is, if Hanuman did not have to lump ac leap across Lanka, no, he would not have known his strength only. So Jambal told him, but it was told because it was needed. The obstacle was unsurmount insurmountable otherwise. So if we focus not on the obstacle, or why is this a big problem? We focus on our purpose. Krishna, I want to serve you. How can I serve you? We have that purpose and we'll discover, by Krishna's grace, we'll discover strengths that we did not know we had. And those are not necessarily our strength. It is Krishna's strength manifesting through us. And thus, we will, through that purpose of devotional intention, through that devotional purpose, the obstacles will turn into opportunities. And we will be able to overcome those roadblocks in our way and create a way for ourselves. Thank you very much. So I'll summarize what I spoke and then we can have some questions. I spoke today on this topic of how obstacles become opportunities for those who are determined. I started by talking about how even in pleasure, we want some challenge. Just sitting passively and watching movies, comedies, after some time that will become boring. Even if we do so play some sports, we want some challenge in the sports so that we can get some stimulation. So we are not just interested in pleasure, we are interested in challenge which when met will provide some, some pleasure that becomes more meaningful. And similarly amidst problems, if we, can, if we are resentful of problems, that problems will exhaust and drain us and make us bitter. But if we voluntarily, okay, this problem is there, we voluntarily accept the problem and then try to find a way through it. Then that problem can inspire us to grow. So we are not so much afraid of pain as purposeless pain. A, a prick by a thorn will irritate us. But a prick by an injection, which is giving us a vaccine, we, it is also still the sensation is the same, but because we see it's meaningful, it's purposeful, we accept it. We will pay for it. So atheism does not remove any problems. It only removes the hope that the problems have a purpose. But theism and the bhakti worldview helps us understand that problems have a purpose. The purpose is our spiritual growth, our spiritual evolution, our realization of our spirituality, our realization of our connection with Krishna and the strength that can come through that connection with Krishna. And we discussed this dynamic in Hanuman's life, how Hanuman, when he was he leapt across to Lanka, he completed his service of giving a message to Sita but decided to do extra service, to give a warning to Ravan and to do a reconnaissance of the forces of Ravan. But in that, he got into trouble. He exhibited his strength by killing many formidable journals, but then he got into trouble. And Ravan wanted to kill him, but then decided to humiliate him. But the very thing that he tried to do to hurt Rav Ra Hanuman ended up hurting him. The tail caught fire, but did not burn. And Hanuman used that opportunity to break free and burned Lanka. Hanuman's burning Lanka was not just mindless violence. It was thoughtful deterrence to give Ravan a glimpse of the power of Ram's I mean, so that that would deter him from antagonizing Ram further. So we don't want to be passive, we don't want to be aggressive, we want to be assertive. And even when he was giving vent to his anger in a healthy way, Hanuman realized that have I gone beyond the limits? Have I set fire to Ashok Vatika? Is Sita safe? So we cannot just justify our anger and say, my anger is righteous. We have to always have some uh, limit, some regulation on it. And then I conclude by talking about how the obstacles actually lead. So that which is an obstacle will eventually increase the glory of the one who faces that obstacle. So because Hanuman was arrested and he escaped, not only escaped, but he wrecked havoc in Lanka. That is his glory. Prabhupada had to face the toughest audience. Now you could say the most spiritually, culturally unreceptive. But when he spiritualized them, that became his glory. So for all of us, obstacles can become the impetuses to discover 
our inner strength and to discover to express that strength externally just like elephant when it is caught in fire or it has some desire that's the time when it pulls against its bondage and bonds and its strength becomes discovered so if we turn toward krishna with a service attitude krishna how can i serve you in this situation then we will discover that by krishna's grace we can be tougher than what we thought we were if we don't have that devotional purpose obstacles and problems will make us bitter but if we have that devotional purpose those same obstacles will become impetuses for us to become better not bitter thank you very much hare krishna No questions can mean two things. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is understood or nothing is understood. <laughs> yes. How do we deal with angry people? Okay. Mm. How do we deal with angry people? Okay. So there is weakness. and there is wickedness weakness is something we all have weakness means there are times when we become weak when the urge to become angry just comes within us and then it overpowers us and then we do something terribly wrong which we should not have done we speak something we do things which we should not have done and then we ourselves feel regretful hey eh? we feel what happened why should not have done like this we apologize we are regretful we uh we feel bad about it and we we acknowledge it was wrong so basically we could say that inside us is our conscience and our intelligence mm. so the conscience at an emotional level tells us don't do this you know if we feel bad when we do it and intelligence tells us with a rational way like this is not right so these are two inner checks within us which stop us from acting wrongly but sometimes that urge of anger overpowers both of them and then we burst out we do certain things so that is weakness but after that there's both conscience and intelligence come back hey i should not have done that so that is weakness but when there is wickedness the conscience has become muted and the intelligence is used not to control the anger but the intelligence is controlled by the anger so weakness makes us hot headed wickedness makes us cold blooded when somebody is cold blooded so they make a complete very systematic diabolical plan how i can hurt this person the most so it's it's anger is basically like a hot emotion hatred is like a emotion that is it's become cold calculative manipulative so generally most people around us in our normal relationships they are not wicked but it's a continuum so if if, if it's a it's a continuum if you see like a spectrum at the top of it is weakness at the bottom of it is wickedness now those who are having wickedness to give forgiveness to wickedness is foolishness <laughs> now suppose some terrorists are on a rampage and they are shooting people and some police come over there and they the police sees the terrorist and the terrorist weapon has fallen down and the police or the police says i'll forgive you the terrorist will pick up the weapon and shoot the police only isn't it so when somebody is at that extreme of wickedness then the strong action has to be taken over there so of course i'm starting with that extreme but i'm talking about a spectrum 
for most people if they get angry but they don't uh, they are not cold blooded about their anger most people around us they have weakness not wickedness but if wickedness is there when they are conscious they don't even feel i did anything wrong and their intelligence they use it not to control their anger but to hurt us with that cold blooded anger then such a we need to create distance from them uh, and we need to take some strong action but on a routine level generally if people become angry it's best that we try to help them deal with the anger rather than saying that you know this person is here i am here and this person is attacking me we try to see that this person is here the anger as a anartha is here and i am here so let us both of us help each other to deal with that anger so that means separate the person from their problematic behavior when we if we label the person this person is a angry person this person is a short tempered person then we reduce that person to their problematic behavior then what happens we and they become antagonists this person is victimizing me and i will i will hit back at them or whatever we don't have to get into that victim victimizer narrative we we at a practical level we may have to deal with things in an appropriate way but at least internally we see the person as separate from their anartha they are here their anger is here and then we try to help them so i and you if we are in a close committed relationship we see that i and you are both partners and let us try to work on this anger together so that would mean that this is of course as saying that if it's a we another complete side of weakness where they also acknowledge its weakness and they want to deal with it then we can see them uh, see them as separate from their problem behavior and then see how we can help them to deal with it so that one way to do that is that it's important to know the triggers of the other person and try as much as possible to avoid those triggers like say if you are going on a road and there is a bump over there and we are going at high speed we don't notice the bump and then suddenly bump then what happens we get severely jolted but next time we are going along that road we will go carefully 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 slow down so similarly if we talk with that we observe that person we ourselves talk with that person and they try to understand what are the things that trigger them especially what are the things that make them angry then when those triggers are coming we we don't do anything to provoke them further see all of us have some will power but our will power is a finite resource it's not an infinite resource so if somebody has had a very tough day at work and they come back in the evening and there is something which they have done which is troubling us and then we bring that up to them they have had 10 10 annoying or 10 annoying or expressing uh, annoying or exasperating things irritating things that have happened to them and then we bring the 11th one <laughs> and then what happens all the frustration of those 10 things plus this th- this 11th thing becomes the trigger for the venting of all the frustration of all those 10 things so then what we need to do is we are rather than okay this thing needs to be dealt with but not now so if we have some healthy channels of communication that means that if that person is already under stress they are very close to their triggering point then if they just tell you know oh, today i had a very tough day okay they just if they can feel confident enough to tell us that to us we have that much closeness that much open channel of communication then we also understand that we don't trigger them at that time and then if we can have some time maybe once a week once a fortnight as is appropriate where we we have a heart to heart talk then what happens if they have something which is nagging them if we have something which is nagging us in a context which is not inflammatory 
say maybe the two people was they they have some focused time together they sit and maybe get themselves in a good consciousness maybe do some kirtan or hear something something spiritual uplifting that calms them and then after that they discuss the good things of the week or the fortnight and the bad things of that week and then see then what happens we can see each other without feeling threatened by what the other person is speaking if we are ourselves insecure then that person's anger adds to our insecurity so basically what i'm trying to say by all this is what we can do for that person is help them manage their triggers better everybody has things which set them off so first what we can do is we don't become a trigger for them and secondly if they are already near that trigger we help them come off the cliff not go not push them further down the cliff mm. that way we can help them but sometimes some people just have to they just go wild then it's best that we keep a distance sometimes you might just have to they, they're just angry and they're doing things generally things just spoken in anger don't take them too seriously what happens is we sometimes hold you spoke like that to me and you hold it for their life against them <laughs> you know how dare you speak like this again i go and i book on the rama and i have talked about this you know when ram had gone to chase after maricha in the form of a deer at that time when maricha spoke in the voice of sita what happened was that sita, sorry ram maricha spoke in the voice of ram is hey, lakshman is hey, sita help so sita became frantic with anxiety he said lakshman go and help ram and lakshman said ram cannot be in any danger <laughs> this is simply the demon impersonating adram no he is in danger go to help him and then what happened is that she in her desperation she spoke a grievous accusation made a grievous accusation against lakshman he said you know you have an evil eye on me and you just been waiting for an opportunity to exploit me now lakshman had never thought like that the words were horribly painful for him just you know just those words seared him more than the arrows of the biggest demons that he had faced he just he just moved away from them just to leave so but there is no description in the ramayan that lakshman held it against sita afterwards it's not that after they found sita and they came back then lakshman told sita you have to apologize to me now <laughs> <laughs> how dare you speak like that to me so don't so the point which i make is that don't see intention in what is spoken intention <laughs> if somebody is intention there are lot of pressure and then they speak something don't see intention in that so all of us sometimes are sometimes situation just bring out the worst within us so when the, when something brings out the worst within us if that is not the way we behave normally that just in extreme situation of stress we spoke or did something like that then just as we wouldn't want the other person to hold it against us similarly we shouldn't hold it against them so uh just understand that sometimes uh, situations can 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 get to even the toughest of us be a little understanding but if that person is, starts becoming uh, habitually angry you know aggressive and violent or whatever then we need to create some distance and then uh, if basically if they want to be helped we can help them but if they don't even acknowledge that i have an issue they don't even think i need to be helped then we need to at that time recognize i cannot help this person i have to make sure that i am safe i keep myself safe and sometimes then the consequences of their actions have to hit them and that's how they learn so it's painful but sometimes that's what we have to do so it will depend a lot on situation to situation so i saw for three main points first is don't understand their triggers and make sure that we don't trigger them second is see them as separate from their their problems problematic behavior and help them as much as you can so and the third point i talked about in the conclusion that there's weakness there's wickedness and i came back to that in the end so whenever there is weakness and somebody succumbs then don't see intention in what is spoken intention 
But if somebody has wickedness, then better keep a distance from and protect ourselves. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yes. So Hanuman had determination. Where did he get that determination from? Okay. <laughs> Hanuman had determination. Where did that he get that determination from? Okay, that's a good question. Actually, I think all the yesterday and yesterday's class, I was going to talk about determination a little bit. Some people say I have no determination. Mm. Say somebody is an alcoholic, mm. and they say I have no determination to give up alcohol drinking. <laughs> But they have determination to keep drinking alcohol. <laughs> Isn't it? Somebody says I have no determination to wake up in the morning. That means you have determination to keep sleeping. <laughs> You know, everybody is waking up. Everybody is calling you lazy. Everybody is giving you dark looks. Come on, wake up! And still, you are determined to keep sleeping. <laughs> so nobody can say I don't have determination. It is just that in some people the determination is misdirected. So everybody has determination. It is just a question of where it is directed. And what is determination? Determination is basically you could say it is concentrated desire. Directed constructively. It's concentrated. We all have desire, but the desire needs to be concentrated. So concentrated means if I have a hundred desires, if somebody says that, if somebody says, okay, for the next one month I have set this hundred goals. Well, hundred goals are not goals; they are a wish list. <laughs> Nobody can achieve hundred. <laughs> okay, so two, three, one, five. You go. Four, five is enough. You cannot do too many things. So there's if there's a wish list, then nothing is going to happen. All of them are going to simply stay wishes. So concentrate. Okay, there are many things I want to do, but what are the things which are most important for me, or what are the things most urgent for me? Concentrate. So concentrated desire. When we concentrate the desire instead of dissipating it over hundred things, one, two, three. These are things I want to focus on. And then directed constructive. Just having a desire is not enough. Okay, how can I work on this desire? What can I do to achieve this? If I say, okay, I want to learn this language. If somebody says, I want to learn hundred languages. Well, you will not learn anything by that. Okay, if I say, okay, I want to learn, I want to learn Spanish. I want to learn Sanskrit. I want to learn Gujarati. Whatever. I want to learn particular language. That's one language. That's concentrated desire. Then. Directed constructive. How do I move forward in that? Okay, maybe I can I can read this book. I can go to this teacher. I can join these classes. I can talk with this person who knows the language. Directed constructive. And as we keep doing this, it starts growing. So determination like muscles. Now when we lift weights, the muscles become stronger, and then we can lift more weights. So we start with whatever determination we have right now, and then the determination will grow. It will grow. It will grow. So Hanuman had this very strong desire to serve the Lord, and then he used his intelligence to direct that desire properly. But the Matam Varishtam, the prayer to Hanuman, it says he is the wisest. He is among the wise people. He is the best. So he was Jitendriya. He was sense controlled. He was wise. So by all that, he could direct it constructively. Okay. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Yes, and there's some question here. Sure. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. So this may be slightly on a personal level, but I was just reading your blog, and in your own words, and I'll just read this out. You say that although I'm still a neophyte in my spiritual life and struggle against selfish desires, writing gives me glimpses of samadhi, blissful absorption in thoughts of Krishna and His message. So. For someone of your stature, I find it very difficult to believe that you have selfish desires. So could you put that in the right right perspective so we can understand what desires can be termed selfish? For example, somebody may have a desire to grow in their career, right? Mm, okay. To pursue their dreams, but somebody wants to evolve in spirituality. I mean, I I find it very difficult to believe that you may have some selfish desires because what you are doing, right, in Krishna consciousness, is all inclusive and trying to bring people or trying to help them evolve spiritually. So. Okay. 
So, what I had written in my blog that I am also struggling with selfish desires. So, what does that mean? See, it's very difficult to know our own motives. Actually, in many ways, we are a mystery to ourselves. <laughs> some people want to read some mystery fiction, watch some mystery novels, but we are ourselves a mystery, in the sense that sometimes we do something and we say, "Hey, why did I do that?" So, why did I do that? Means then, who did that? You only did it. No, no, but there's something, some strange influence came within me and we did that. So basically, there are we ourselves, our consciousness, our mind is complicated. So. Rather than thinking of whether somebody is selfish or selfless, we can see our desires as multi-layer. Multi-layer means I could say that at least as a over overall life direction, yes, my desire is to serve Krishna, to glorify Krishna, to develop devotion to Krishna. But it's not that there is only that desire. From our past conditionings, from our social situations, so many other desires are there. Now we all try to battle with those desires and try to restrain those desires. But when we are doing a particular thing, it's uh, it's not so easy to understand for ourselves also why am I doing this. So basically, I, I write. Now why do I write? I could say that. Uh, I want to glorify Krishna. Okay, that's true, but is that the only desire, only reason? I don't know. I like writing. If I had not been, if I had not been fortunate enough to encounter the path of Krishna Bhakti through devotees, maybe I, I would have been a writer and I would be writing on some other subject. So I could say that I am writing because that's what my body and mind are best suited for. So that's just my I am acting according to my nature, but because I am on the path of Krishna Bhakti, so I am doing it for Krishna. But then I could also say that I am writing because uh, I I want people to, I want people to recognize what your talents I have, what your contributions I am making. I can't say that that desire is not there. Hopefully, that is not my driving desire, but that desire is also there. So all these are mixed up, and the the way we grow in our spiritual life is by gradual purification of intent. It is not that we start with pure intent. And sometimes we come to know, oh, this I was doing, actually I was doing it for, it was primarily driven by my own self-centered desires. Then, okay, I should not do this. Or, okay, I was going off this track, then I'll come on this track. So we say that desire is, oh, the desires are not, uh, Uniform, they are multi-layered. So, for, for example, now, many times after a class, if somebody comes and says, I like the class, I usually ask them, what did you like in the class? <laughs> so now, I ask this question specifically to, generally to understand that, you know, what is it that I speak many points in my class, so which points, are con which points the audience connects with? And many times, through that I learn, you know, what points I can elaborate on more, what points I can address in my future classes. And so that's my motive. But I was uh, talking with one devotee, one senior devotee. And uh, he said he appreciated my class. And this devotee is very incisive. Uh, he, he is known to, to, what is the word they say? To do open heart surgery without anesthesia. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, it was a great class. And then I asked, so what did you like about the class? Why are you fishing for compliments? <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, am I, am I really fishing for compliments? Maybe. At least that's not my conscious objective. But I don't know. Subconscious, that might be a desire. I remember one time, I, 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 there's a wonderful, there's one devotee came after class with a broad smile on his face. He says, that was a terrible class. And he had a broad smile on his face. <laughs> what is going on? I was shocked. Isn't it? <laughs> Smiling. <laughs> the terrible class. That's what do you mean. And then I understood he actually meant terrific class. 
<laughs> so just use the wrong word. <laughs> so <clears throat> the way we become purified, we do, we have very few of us actually start with pure desire. It is that the mix of various motives with which we are serving Krishna, and as we keep serving Krishna, gradually we become purified. So. in many ways as a speaker you know you can as we keep serving krishna we start realizing that we are not the doers sometimes i prepare a class very systematically and then when i give the class throughout the class the audience is sitting as if as if you know it's like they are watching a foreign language movie without subtitles <laughs> and then nobody connects with anything <laughs> and sometimes i'm just tired and i don't have much time to prepare and i give a spontaneous class and people are overwhelmed right it's such a brilliant class here really so you start understanding you're not the doer not that you're not the doer but you're not the sole doer so basically to conclude this what well, there's a there's a nice incident of shri prabhupad he had come to a temple and there was a disciple of prabhupad who was doing kirtan very sweet kirtan he would do And Prabhupad, as he Prabhupad came to temple to take darshan, and Prabhupad just patted him on his back and he says, "Nice kirtan." And now he thought, "I'll never get associated with my spiritual master again." He says, "He says, but but Prabhupad, sometimes I feel proud." And Prabhupad again tap, tap, patted him on the back and says, "What's wrong with that?" And walked away. And now he says, "What is wrong with pride? Pride is one of the anarthas. You know, it can it is so terrible." And Prabhupad says, "What's wrong with that?" Now, what Prabhupada meant by that was, let's see, it's not that we, right from the practice of starting practice of bhakti, will be free from pride. Mm -hmm. So we all have pride within us, and sometimes if somebody can sing very nicely, and they think I will not sing because if I sing, I'll become proud. Mm -hmm. But then what happens? They they don't do that singing service. Somebody else that does that service, and then then they are praised. you feel envious why is this person being praised so much so that pride comes out as envy <laughs> another thing is it's not that when you think that if i sing nicely then i will become proud thinking like that itself is pride <laughs> why because you are thinking you are not proud right now <laughs> see pride is there in our heart already but what is it that we already have pride but we have no reason to express that pride it is i i already have pride but there is no there is no nothing which i have done for which i can be proud so it's not that we are free from pride so what the cure for pride is not suppression of talent the cure for pride is purification of intent so yes I, i i might be speaking about krishna singing about krishna and i might be it it might be my pride but after some time as we keep doing that service we will realize that actually whatever praise i might get by other from others that is not as fulfilling as just the absorption in krishna through this service i once gave a class and Uh, I prepared. I was very absorbed in preparing the class, and I delivered the class very well. And after that class, not a single person came and appreciated the class at all. I was initially feeling a little annoyed, but sometimes the Krishna's mercy, when I go through some difficulties, it's like almost like I see myself from outside my body. You Now look, it's like self-examination basically. And it struck me at that time, hey, you know, while you were preparing for the class, you were absorbed. while you are delivering the class you are absorbed and now you are agitated you are dissatisfied so i said that actually the even if somebody had come and appreciated that would just been for a few moments i might have felt good and then i would have forgotten that so the real purpose of speaking about krishna is not appreciation from others the real purpose of speaking about krishna is absorption in krishna that absorption is what we ultimately want to attain krishna and absorption 
will actually give us far more lasting satisfaction than any appreciation. Now, if we get appreciation, we can see that as encouragement. Okay, Krishna has gifted me in this way and this is why I can serve more. But that is not our purpose. But if I had not spoken, I would not have got this experience, I would not have got this realization. So, basically, we all may have selfish desires. We don't know. We don't know what is, what is driving us right now. But it is by serving Krishna, by connecting with Krishna, that, that whatever selfishness is there will be exposed and then it will be expelled. Oh, I was doing this because of... I, I'm feeling bad because I was doing this for my own glorification and not getting it right now. Okay, but am I really doing this? Should I be doing this for my own glorification? How much am I going to get by that? Absorption will be much better. So in that sense, uh, rather than claiming that I am having self, I am driven only by selfish desires or I am driven only by selfless desires, we recognize that there are desires are multi-level. Multi -level. And by the practice of bhakti, we will move towards purer and purer intent. Does it answer your question? Thank you. Yes. Uh, yesterday, uh, you had spoken about the Sita and the Vedavati being replaced by Sita. Yeah. I just have a. I didn't hear the whole recording. I may have missed something. So correct me if I am wrong. Um, so today, in this today's class, you mentioned about how Sita was trained for Hanuman. So if it is Vedavati who has taken the place of Sita, um, how do you understand? Uh, Okay. Mm. So I said Sita was praying for Hanuman, but if Vedavati has taken the place of Sita. Okay, so there is the important principle over there that when Vedavati took that role, she was given all that is required for taking up that role. And we have to see things from the right perspective. Like yesterday I talked about different frames of reference. You know, we can see things in different frames of reference. So we need to focus on the right frame of reference or the more, more constructive frame of reference to understand things. Say for example, this particular program. Now, if we take a, a photo of this program. Now, if you wanted to focus on who is the speaker, then you would frame that photo, means take the frame in a particular way. If you want to show how many people had come for the program, then you could frame the picture in a different way. If you want to show how interested the audience were, then you could frame it in a different way. You wanted, if you want to show how, how is the facility for this program, if you want to do a future program, then you would frame it in a different way. If you want to focus on a particular person who had come for the program, then you would frame it in a different way. The program is the same, but you can frame it in different ways. So, uh, in the Ramayana, the, the principle that there was, uh, in the Valmiki Ramayana, there is no mention of Maya Sita. Because the Valmiki Ramayana's framing is one particular thing. The primary framing of the Valmiki Ramayana is, who is a person of ideal character? And so then, Ram's ideal character is that, he is so at one level so self-sacrificing that he gave up his kingdom when his father told him to. But at the same, that's not weakness. He's also so heroic that even without any support from anyone in his kingdom, he by his own resourcefulness formed an army and he took on the most powerful demon at his times. Around and he overcame him and he regained Sita. So the Valmiki Ramayana's framing doesn't talk about Maya Sita because its purpose is one thing, to glorify Ram as an ideal human being. But there is another framing that we can take, okay, that um, how could the goddess of fortune even be touched by a, she is supremely pure, how can she be even touched by the impure uh, touch of a wild demon like Ravana? So now if that is the frame, if the focus is on Sita's purity, then we have Vedavati coming into the and actually, it was not Sita who was touched, it was Vedavati who was touched. And she was touched, not in the, she was not contaminated, but 
no, she had he had touched her in the previously and that touch came back to hit him back again so if you put a different frame of reference in where it is not appropriate then you can have all kinds of uh, uh, messy things coming up you know then you could even say that okay if ram wanted sita why did he even have to go to lanka he could just have gone to agni and got sita back is it <laughs> but that's not the frame of reference we need the right frame of reference if now normally we say that if we are having some problems we could say it is because of our past karma we are having problems but say imagine if a mother if a mother has a newborn baby and the baby is crying the mother says oh the baby is crying because of her past karma <laughs> that's ridiculous you know don't think of that frame at all right now the baby is crying your dharma is to comfort the baby but sometimes it may happen that despite our best effort to comfort the baby to treat the baby if some of the baby stays in pain then we can put that frame of reference so i think this whole frame of reference of vedha of sita being vedavati that is talked about primarily to talk about the to stress the purity of the goddess of fortune otherwise there is no mention of sita uh, not being sita but being vedavati for all practical purposes she acted just like sita okay Thank you. Hare Krishna. Yes. Uh, how to practice to always work in consciousness of Krishna, uh, not doing so like all our anadas coming up. Uh, how to how to overcome the anadas and how to always work in consciousness of Krishna. How to always work in the consciousness of Krishna and not let anadas come out. Okay. See, our anadas are like. Mm, if you consider the urges, so these urges have surges. <laughs> that means it's not that we are say if it's anger or it's lust or it's greed or it's envy. It's not that it is always at a high level. It might be there in some people, but still they sometimes go very high up. And otherwise they are normal. They are at a manageable level. Mm. So now. many times we concentrate all our attention on dealing with that surge when that urge goes up how can i deal with it but sometimes when that surge comes we might just be helpless in that so what happens at that if we just focus on that we will become disheartened i think i can i can just i just can't give it up so if we can't resist our urges we can still persist between our urges that means that when the that particular anatha shoots up we can't do anything about it we might succumb but what do we do in between if in between we just keep beating ourselves i'm such a terrible person i'm so fallen i'm so fallen and so on then next time the urge come again we will succumb to it but if in between we can focus on being conscious of krishna let me try to be as conscious of krishna as possible as in between by that we will gain strength and as we keep gaining strength so there are times when being conscious of krishna is very difficult we just our consciousness completely consumed by worldly things okay if we start with that it will become we will feel as if krishna conscious is impossible but let's start with where we can be conscious of krishna say if we are sitting in a class at that time also our mind may wander but if i am sitting in a class and i take up the cover phone and start looking at all the messages and the emails and so many other things then although i have it's possible for me to conscious of krishna but i am not being conscious so let's start with where it is possible and do that as much as we can so we could say that our consciousness there are times when we can be directly conscious of krishna there are times when we have to do our work we are not so conscious of krishna but we are not into maya also we are not directly thinking of anger or lust or things like that and there are times when we are completely consumed by our urges so if we begin when we have the opportunity to be conscious of krishna we try to be as conscious as possible begin with that and if we keep doing that that itself will strengthen us and enable us at other times also to be conscious 
and at other times say when we are doing our various work and other things if we can just create some periodic reminders of krishna that means maybe after we complete one 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 particular item in our day we complete it some significant item then we just close our eyes maybe take a few deep breaths and thank krishna narayana eti samarpayami krishna i am doing this for you even if it is a pa- externally seeming a material work but say we complete one pro- one assignment at our workplace we complete one thing at our home it's some it's very difficult to remember krishna while we are doing a thing but we can remember him before we do it and after we do it so like that that will keep us at least a little bit conscious of krishna and then with respect to our urges i'm going to talk more about this in tomorrow's class on inner power on sunday feast but basically we have to understand that our urges we they are not going to be at the same level all the time they rise and then they decrease again so when they rise if the mind it deludes us in thinking that this is how they are going to be all the time and then we think okay how can i tolerate it all the time like that i can't and we give it up so it's like mm. when a lion is to be trained lion is to be trained uh, at by at by say it's a wild lion is to be domesticated and the trainer doesn't feed the lion and when the lion is not fed it starts roaring and starts roaring very fiercely and it may bang against its cage and it may make such horrible sounds and faces the trainer may get intimidated hey if i don't feed this lion lion what will it do now although the lion may becoming may be becoming scarier it is not becoming stronger actually it is becoming weaker and if that trainer can pass through that phase when the lion is intimidating then eventually the lion will become weak and it will do what it's told to do and then it can be fed so when our urges become very strong sometimes we feel hey this is so strong and how will i how can i resist it but we have to recognize that that surge is not going to be permanent so we just have to endure it during that time so at that time if we can find something which we like to do in our krishna consciousness at, at that at that time say if we like kirtan or if we like a particular picture of krishna say and we keep that ready with us or if we like a particular quote and we keep that quote with us then read it read remember that verse remember that quote so something which we like to do if we can do that then that will give us that redirection of thought inner strength so that way we can even uh, fight when the urge is on top by recognizing that this is not going to last forever let me just endure it if we think this is the level it is going to be for the whole day or the whole week or the whole month or the whole year for the rest of my life then what will say if we think this is going to be for the rest of my life then we will think okay let me leave self control as a project for the rest of my life <laughs> but no it's temporary so that way by primarily focusing on being as krishna conscious as possible when the direct opportunity is there by spiritualizing the remaining work of our life so that at least before and after we are krishna conscious and by remembering that the urges they are temporary so we don't have to uh, become intimidated by them intimidated by them but we can perceive it and even if during the surges we fall the still we rise continuing moving on see we may fall down but we should never fall away sometimes our urges may cause us to fall down fall down means we do something which we are not meant to do but fall away means we give up the practice of krishna bhakti temporary our early our mind our senses the world's temptations our conditionings may make us do something which we are not meant to do but after that again resume our krishna bhakti and then we can move onward till we eventually become stronger in, strong enough to overcome the urges okay so thank you very much shila prabhu pad ki gaur bhakta vind ki jai gaur pranam so uh, we have few books but just wanted to let all of you know that there is only one lecture left tomorrow which is